very hard to follow uh, those excellent presentations, so I'll, I'll uh, try to focus briefly on the questions and just note that at about a quarter past, um, I'm going to dash over to UN Women, where we'll be um, linking with some of you, I hope, ODI colleagues and uh, Nyla and others uh, on the advisory group on the ongoing consultation that the UN is co-facilitating on inequalities. Um, I got all the questions clearly except for Emma's, I think it was Emma at the end, which was too faint. Um, but I know that the first uh, issue was uh, raised by Tim, uh, whether uh, future goals and, and, and goals frameworks uh, could or should focus on income or groups. My answer would be uh, both, the, uh, both income issues um, and, and um, referring back to some of the discussions around uh, options there with uh, the Palma as, as uh, a very interesting option. Uh, and other ways of looking at income-based uh, inequalities, but also uh, group-related uh, inequalities. Uh, I think we could envisage and hopefully work towards a, a construct proposal which would combine a headline goal, uh, ambitious and related to human rights uh, around inequalities, um, which would feature prominently uh, at different levels, uh, the different groups uh, that are uh, affected by widespread um, uh, deprivation and inequality, as well as income, livelihood, and perhaps employment-related measures. So an overall construct with plenty of room for elaboration of the different dimensions of inequality at the levels of certainly the targets and indicators much more use of disaggregation than in, in the common framework, in the present framework. And I think the need is to uh, try to coalesce around a powerful and multidimensional pr uh, proposal uh, for a goal or even a set of goals around inequalities that reflect the complexity uh, of the issue and the, the research and analysis that now exists to help us uh, to do that. And that way, issues of disability certainly issues of gender, certainly issues of um, minority and ethnic status, issues of locality, issues of household wealth, which all correlate with other goals and other outcomes could be brought out in a new framework. But I think it does need work now very seriously to move towards a consolidated proposal that could achieve consensus among the various ideas that now exist. There are um, alternative ideas, uh, not just around income, but whether the headline goal should, should be on or around gender and women's empowerment, or whether it should be on inequalities overall with gender and women's empowerment as a major element. So that, that coalescence needs to take place, otherwise I fear that we may uh, fall between the different uh, uh, stools and, and, and not have uh, political traction. Um, Claire, at the Claire, I don't know how you do this. You, 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 you must have taken the red eye last night, but you, uh, uh, Claire was at the uh, Open Working Group on Sustainable Development Goals as a panelist uh, yesterday afternoon in New York, which would have been uh, evening in the UK. So Claire is doing terrific work there. Um, uh, and Claire mentioned the, uh, some of the different options uh, that the inequalities consultation and many other uh, people and, and, and commentators ha have put forward uh, in uh, around the way that goals might be framed in order to capture the complexities around the issue. One of, one of the ideas that, that uh, we and Save the Children and others have been talking about are zero-based targets. Uh, Claire brought this up. Um, that would uh, relate directly to universality uh, of human rights and say um, zero preventable deaths among children and women, zero stunting, um, uh, zero uh, incidence of discrimination, 100% coverage of uh, basic health care, of, of clean water access, and so on and so forth. And there could be many types and variations of zero goals. I think because of the way that the understanding around inequalities also bears not only on the manifestations that zero-based goals can, can address, but also the structural drivers of inequality, um, our feeling is that it would need to be zero-based targets plus 
proactive and specific measures in policy, legislation, uh, perhaps uh, social cultural um, uh, initiatives as well to address structural factors uh, in addition to the uh, headline goals that can be tackled through a sort of refined and, and empowered MDG uh, type approaches. So structural factors such as discrimination of, of many kinds, pervasive gender-based discrimination, uh, exclusion of persons with disabilities, uh, minority and ethnic and indigenous groups and so on. Um, violence uh, of all kinds, uh, necessary concerted action to address violence, fear of violence of different kinds as a barrier to inclusion, um, the need for uh, various forms of protection against violence, abuse, exploitation, trafficking, uh, and so on, uh, and stigma. And the possibility of using, I very much agree with, with the comment on social protection. Uh, using social protection means, uh, and as part of that or linked to that, interventions, particularly in the earliest years of life, early childhood, there's quite a bit of evidence. And I was looking at U.S. Census data analysis over the weekend to suggest that early childhood interventions uh, among families who are deprived and excluded households uh, can be a very powerful leveling um, factor uh, or, or instrument uh, in, in policy. So those were some of the thoughts on the politics of this. And again, I would refer back to Claire maybe to talk a bit more about it. Uh, yesterday, in the first substantive discussion in the Open Working Group on Sustainable Development Goals at the UN, which is now, I think, the main instrument for taking these discussions forward, uh, and we'll take account, obviously, of the high-level panels report, but then the report uh, will um, uh, be, be tabled and, and the Open Working Group will continue until next year. The Open Working Group, there was quite a bit of recognition of the issue uh, of inequalities. Uh, many of the regional blocs, um, Europeans, G77 and so on, made reference to it. However, I think there is a tendency still to say that, well, if we focus on eradicating extreme poverty, then inequalities will be taken care of. Whereas actually from the consultation, uh, for example, we're seeing it uh, almost the other way around, it is that you cannot effectively eradicate extreme poverty unless you simultaneously and systematically address the inequalities that underpin and reproduce extreme poverty. In other words, the, the driving factors of inequalities, discrimination, exclusion, violence, etc., unless these two are addressed, the uh, efforts simply to say, okay, let's have an extreme poverty eradication target without uh, proactive measures to address the underlying inequalities and the structural drivers of inequalities will not be successful. And I think this is a very difficult case to make politically. Um, most of the discussions, I would say, so far among member states at the UN have been primarily sector-based with a recognition of poverty eradication uh, as a desirable and, and very, very probable goal, but without so far recognition of the need to address the structural underpinnings of extreme poverty uh, and around exclusion and inequalities. I hope that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was really helpful. And I think the point about needing to come up with some sort of consolidated positions to make ourselves all more effective in this area is very well taken and something that we should all think about. Now, time is very short, so I'm not going to give the other panellists an opportunity to respond to this round of questions. I'm going to take another round and then give everybody an opportunity to make any final remarks that they that they feel need to make. Apologies, we have run over. This is not normal ODI practice. Thank <laughs> you.